This episode is brought to you by the Innovative Leadership Institute, working with companies that recognize the need to upskill their leaders and transform their organizations. We help executive teams prepare for accelerated uncertainty by creating the foresight needed to stay competitive and transforming organizations to become future ready. If you'd like to discuss how we can help prepare your organization for tomorrow, please visit InnovativeLeadership.com and click Contact Us. This is Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. I'm your host, Maureen Metcalf, the founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute. We help leaders be future ready. Helping us on this mission today is Sonia Shelton, founder of Executive Leadership Consulting and author of You're an Executive, But Are You a Leader? We'll be talking about strategy, culture, and burnout. Sonia, what a great topic. I can't imagine how many of our listeners are thinking, boy, I wish my boss had read this book. Tell us a little bit about how you got here and why this book. Before starting Executive Leadership Consulting, I was the head of internal communications for the Walt Disney Company globally. And I was there at a time when nobody in my position had ever experienced what I experienced and nobody in that position will ever experience it again. I was head of global communications internally during a shareholder revolt where a member of the Disney family was ousting our CEO. So as Roy Disney was leading a shareholder revolt against our CEO at the time, Michael Eisner. So imagine, I'm like the head of internal communications, basically in a company going through a divorce. I learned so much from my own leadership, how I showed up as a leader in that time, taking some of the stresses that happened that I'd passed down to my team and behaved unlike how I knew I should because of how I was being treated. That was one of the things that I learned. And then also working in a company that's known for its culture. The best of the best cultures being at the worst of the worst times in that company. So I really got to see the two extremes, right? How do you do it really well? And then how does it go when it goes really badly? And I developed incredible empathy for what leaders are going through because of what I experienced and really became passionate about helping leaders grow and become better leaders and show up to how they can learn how to be and then stay consistent with how they know how to be. One, I'm just sorry you went through that. And how fortunate with regard to being a learning experience, nobody gets that. Thank you for being willing to share with our listeners what you learned from what I presume is incredibly trying and dramatic and also a once in a lifetime learning opportunity. Was it stressful? Sure. Some of my clients will say, oh, you've probably never seen a company as bad as ours. No, you've probably never seen these kinds of issues. It's like, no, nothing scares me. Like nobody's been through what I've been through. I don't know many companies that would go through that. It's a pretty, as you said, once in a lifetime opportunity, but really prepared me for what I do now in helping leaders really create amazing cultures. That translated into your book. Yeah, absolutely. Now you've gone through this Disney experience. Did you start writing the book after you left? Yes. So one of the things that I realized, and I saw it show up at Disney, but I started seeing it once I started executive leadership consulting, where people were leaning into their title and expecting people to follow them because of their title, as opposed to actually leading, to creating that strong purpose, that strong vision, where are we going, helping them align into a particular direction. They kind of just went, well, I'm an executive, so therefore you must do what I say. And I say, you can do that and you can get compliance, but you're not going to get engagement and you're definitely not going to get passion. So I really designed the book, you know, kind of thinking of myself as an executive, like what did I need? What is the format of the book that I could use, right? And so it's 50 chapters, which might sound overwhelming, but each chapter is one page each. It's a very short book. One page is the tip. The next page is the case study. And the next page is the coaching questions I would ask you around that aspect of leadership. So I took what I had learned from my clients and to protect confidentiality, created some composites of those clients that had faced some of those situations. And how did they implement that tip? So I've had leaders take it as a workbook. I've had some use it as something they come back to again and again. And they just look at what is it that they need help with in that moment? and designed it specifically for leaders. And we don't have a lot of time to be reading a 400-page book. So so just tried to make it really applicable and simple for somebody to take it and execute. 
I love that it's bite size, easy to execute. And while there are tons of publications about leadership, it's rare how many have anything that's novel. It feels like it's all a rehash of the stuff we've seen and is often not terribly actionable. It feels like it's more for the author to gain credibility than the reader to actually get some differentiated value from the trees they've killed to generate the paper that they're going to carry around with them. Yeah, absolutely. And and we talk about purpose as a place to start. So we agree with Simon Sinek in starting with why, but it's also the how and the what, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the really everything that we do starts with what's the purpose of this? Like, what are we trying to achieve here? And for me, my why is to have impact, right? So I want people to even if they're not able to work with us, to be able to take that information and apply it to their leadership. Because I know, as you've said, that that level of leadership can make a huge impact on a large amount of people in bigger companies, especially if they don't have it right. It doesn't just impact the company, it impacts those people's lives. It's all about impact for me. And look at all of the people who are no longer employed in Silicon Valley right now. And it's people who are supporting elderly parents. It's people who are paying kids tuition. It's human beings doing a job so that they can support their families. And those folks, many of them, are now scrambling to figure out how to make that happen. I think leaders don't always take that into consideration. So when you have a bad day at work or you're feeling burned out and overwhelmed at your job and you come home, the people in your life get impacted by that. Your family, your friends, how you show up for them gets impacted. And then it creates ripple effects into the community because if you're bringing home that negativity, then that puts them in a negative space and then they pass that on at the grocery store. So it continues to impact the whole community. Sometimes leaders don't actually look at what are the ripple effects of their leadership? How is that rippling out into the world and how people are showing up in their lives? So as I listen to you, I think about the intersection between personal purpose and passion that you talk about and the fiduciary responsibility of maximizing profit in a company like Disney. If I'm taking a paycheck as an executive, I need to be attending to this. So it's not a nice to do. It's a requirement by statute. And so how do you balance that Venn diagram of I want to be a good person, I want to make a great impact on my community, and there are times I'm required to make decisions that I know will adversely impact the precious people in my organization. As I mentioned, we always start with purpose. So executive leadership consulting, our model is called Red Thread Leadership. And we use purpose to connect the red thread through everything that we do, from your plan, your strategy, to your processes, to your positions, to the passion of the culture. When you have that really clear purpose, first of all, you can make better decisions about is this aligned with who we are and where we're going or isn't it? So I find it actually creates not only a great culture that's purpose driven. And when I say purpose, it could be things like sustainability and what's good for the planet and what's good for people. When we talk about purpose, it's really about what's your purpose as a company? What's your purpose as an executive in that company? What's your team's purpose? And looking at how do those things align with who you serve? And when you're living from that place, so it actually creates a lot of innovation. When you empower people to say, this is what our purpose is, and this is where we're going. Now let's look at our processes. Are these processes aligned with who we are and where we're going? If they're not, say something. You, you probably see this a lot with, in your work. People will be doing a process that's you know maybe bureaucratic and you ask them, why are you doing it that way? And they say, oh, well, because you know Maria, who used to work here five years ago, liked to see it this way. And so we've just always done it that way. And nobody ever questioned it. Kind of working around a person as opposed to the most effective and efficient processes. And through that, you can start to develop that profitability and not in a way where people feel like, oh, we have to cut back, but more about how are we bringing our purpose and our vision to life and what's the fastest way for us to get there and the most efficient way for us to get there. They will come up with ideas that you would never even have imagined because they're connected to that purpose and they have passion for that purpose and they understand their role in that purpose. And so they're actually going to lead to more profitability when they really are connected to that. 
I completely agree that people are motivated, especially our millennials and younger are especially motivated by purpose. My sense is all of us are. It just, for people older, and I'm in the older bucket, weren't always allowed to focus on purpose. We focused on good people get the job done. And purpose is a luxury versus purpose is the core. I consider myself incredibly fortunate that I get to do something that is completely aligned with my purpose. But I know not everyone has that luxury. I appreciate you start with that. And I also appreciate that a lot of people are doing jobs that will position them in the future to align with their purpose. But right now they're moving in that direction and they don't yet have that luxury. So I want to talk a little bit about the younger generation's connection to purpose and our generations. So I'm also in that older generations that, yes, I think purpose is important to everybody, but the younger generations won't put up with it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Whereas we would we would say, okay, well, we need security. We didn't realize the power that we had. They realize the power that they have and they won't put up with it. If I'm not connected to your purpose, I'm not interested. And that's when we see things, you know, where they're disengaged and quiet quitting and all of those things because they're just not going to put up with it. And then I think there's also for people who feel like they're in a job that's not connected to their purpose, I actually find that people aren't really clear about what their purpose is. Mm -hmm. And coming back to the why, like, why do you do what you do? And the reason they're not clear is because in neuroscience, that lives in the part of the brain that doesn't have language. It lives in the limbic brain. Interesting. And so it's really hard for us to connect with our why when we kind of know what it is and we know what it isn't, but it's hard for us to articulate. And we actually use a process with our clients called Why Connection that uses an algorithm to ask them questions to get to what is their why? Why do they do what they do? How do they deliver on that why? And what can others expect from you in about 10 minutes? That's how you operate. But how do you bring that to life and connect that to what you're doing in your work? And is this job where you are the right place for you to deliver that? Maybe, maybe not. But even if it's not, you can start to bring that to life by explaining, this is how I operate. So I mentioned for me, my why is contribute, which is all about bringing impact and value. So if I'm working somewhere or with a person where I feel like they don't want to do the work or they're not actually moving forward, I step out because I say, I'm not making an impact here. This is going to make both of us frustrated and it's not bringing my why to life. And so that helps me make decisions. Can I make an impact here? Can I not make an impact here? And then I make decisions based on that. And we take that at every level from the individual leader to the team and to the company. And it really speeds up the process of making decisions because you know if it aligns with your purpose or not. I'm curious because I haven't heard about anything that does this connected to neuroscience. Is it an algorithm? Is it a, do I do it on my phone? How does it work? And then how does it tie individual to team to workplace? So the first step is the algorithm. It's called the Y Discovery we partner with the Y Institute on doing the discovery part. But what I found is that when people just do the discovery, they kind of look at it like a Facebook quiz, right? They, they go, oh, yeah, that's me. And then they move on, right? They don't actually apply it. And so that's why we bring in the connection part to say, okay, now that you know this about yourself, how do you can actually apply it to be your purpose? It's how you operate. But how can you connect the dots to what you're doing today or what you ultimately want to do? So we take that as at the individual level. And then we look at the team. So what I've found is that at the team level can do two things. One helps to say, who are we as a team? It connects to their values. Why do we do what we do? How do we deliver on that? And what can others expect from us? That could be a leadership team of a company. That could be the leadership team of a function. That could be managers of a department. It doesn't matter what level of the organization. They are contributing something as a team. So connecting to the why sort of creates this unification of who we are as a team. But we can also look at a matrix of everyone else is on the team, individual why, how, and what. And we call it your superpower. How can I leverage the superpower of somebody else whose strength of why they do what they do and how they do it is different than mine. And I'm not as good at that, right? It might be a challenge for me. And then the second thing is really looking at how do they get along? As an example, I had two clients. One was the leader of another, both executives, and they were really, really locking heads. The one who was the leader was not getting what they wanted out of the person that worked for them, the person that worked for them. She was really struggling with feeling like she couldn't do anything right. And when we did their why connection, we found out that 
the leader's why was challenge. She likes challenging the status quo, breaking the boundaries, being innovative. The person who worked for her, her why was right way. So the right way of doing things, repeatable systems and processes, both extremely valuable and very complementary. But until they understood that about each other, they were in conflict instead of seeing those skills as being complementary. And now they work amazingly with each other, where when it's time to innovate and come up with new ideas, the person whose challenge is why steps forward. When it's time to implement those ideas and make that repeatable, the person whose why is right way steps forward, right? And so they've really learned how to complement each other. But I actually think that it wouldn't have worked out that way. I think that probably the person whose why was right way would have left the organization and not had a good experience and the company would have lost her value. And then looking at the company level, we do this same thing. Like, what's your why as a company? Why do you do what you do? What's your driver? And then what is your how? How do you bring that why to life? And then what can the people who are buying your service or product expect from you? We help them create a branding statement around that, that they can then apply internally and externally to connect to their purpose. I realize this is simplistic, but there's a dictionary behind my answers that categorizes me into one of 10 or 20 or six why statements. Mm -hmm. Is that true? How many are there? So there's nine versions of the why and nine of the how and nine of the what. So there's all kinds of combinations that it can be. And I think it's important to know that each one also has its challenges so that they have their superpower, but they also have their challenges. So for example, my how is finding better ways and sharing them, right? So always looking for how can I make it better? And what I realized is that sometimes that can be received as somebody feeling like nothing is good enough for me because I'm always looking at how can we do it better? Nothing is ever status quo with me. And I actually started using it in interviews when people join our company. I talk about my why connection. And I say, as the founder, my why connection impacts the culture of the company. So I say, you know, we're all about making an impact when we're all about finding better ways of serving our clients. So If you're looking for a place that is more predictable and very status quo and doesn't change a lot, this is not the place for you because that's not how I work, right? And then I also say, you know, and I'm always going to look for better ways. That doesn't mean that I don't think what you're doing is valuable or what your ideas are valuable, but I'm always going to be looking for how can we make it better? And it's not personal. And since I've started doing that as a leader, it's really changed the dynamic of how people show up where they know that about me. So they're actually bringing more ideas because they know I'm always looking for a better way and I'll take it from anywhere. And I would say we're similar. I am absolutely about impact. And for me, it's about we're at a point in time where the world is changing dramatically. And leaders, in my view, are the fulcrum for a lot of those changes. And so the more effective leadership we have will literally change the future path that our planet's on. And so right now, and I'll use AI as the example, we know there are scenarios of dramatic health improvements possible through research using AI and quantum computing. And then we've got the, will AI become sentient and kill us all? (laughs) So that's that's the range. It is plausible. In fact, it would be unlikely that we wouldn't accelerate healthcare improvements. I don't know how likely it is that we'll have sentient machines that really take over the world. What I do believe is that There are some leaders in positions of authority whose decisions will drive the probability of either of those outcomes. And so how do we help leaders at the point where we need to be making these decisions now, not a decade from now, not 30 years from now, Today, we need to be thinking about what we're building and what will result from that. Like years ago when we had laws about cloning, human cloning and animal cloning, had we not put certain gates in place, I could be looking at a clone of you right now. Now I could be looking at an AI version of you, but not a human clone. So it just seems like what leaders do today will impact our future. Hence, our why is all about the impact. And similarly, we're always looking to experiment and improve because the world is changing quickly. Status quo doesn't work for us. Yeah. But that's not our goal. And I think you bring up a good point because things are moving so fast and we're changing a lot. We work across many industries and every single industry we work in, I see things are moving really fast and there's a lot of uncertainty. 
leaders getting very reactive in that, right? To say, well, this is coming at me, so we need to do this. Or I read this article, and so now we need to do this. And changing directions and not having that grounding in their purpose is where we could end up with bad decisions about not looking forward to see what is that long-term impact about the decision that I'm making right now. And so having that purpose actually grounds you in making those decisions. Is this aligned with the purpose? Asking that question about what is the purpose of that and not being reactive to everything that comes your way. You mentioned earlier burnout that's happening in organizations, I think, is also connected to these two things of the speed of change and the uncertainty. People are running really fast, but kind of like on a treadmill where they don't really see where they're going. They can't see. Things are changing too fast. We don't know where things are going to be three years from now. We have no idea. That's not how it used to be. And so it is creating a lot of burnout. But when you connect to that passion and purpose, that gives you the resilience and anti-fragile to be able to get through those changes because you keep your feet on the ground with your purpose, almost like a tree, like those are your roots. You can get blown away, yet you can still stand. All those changes that are happening, you just keep coming back to your purpose. Yes, okay, this is changing in the marketplace. This is changing in our business industry. Okay, How does that connect to our purpose? And then what do we do from there? Otherwise, leaders can get very reactive and we don't make decisions well from a place of feeling burned out and overwhelmed. I see this in organizations, like what is a really good scalable model as an individual applies to a company. And so I see like when we're personally under stress, all of our energy goes to our limbs, right? So we can run, we can fight. Physiologically, that's what happens. And I see this in organizations show up too, right? When they're under stress, there's a lot of activity, but nothing's really happening. (laughs) They're not making good decisions. They're not coming from a place of strategic, thoughtful choices on how are we going to handle what's being thrown at us? They're just doing a lot of activity and that leads to burnout too. Yeah, I'm working with a client whose CEO recently resigned and the direct reports to the CEO are now in a position of needing to prove themselves, which is board steps in. Each person needs to show their value. And it's hard not to have a little bit of hopefully strategic activity, but going from we're in a groove and we're all working toward the mission and we're doing it in some aligned way to now everybody having to basically re-interview for their jobs. Well, they haven't said you're re-interviewing for your jobs. When the board member sits down at your desk and says, tell me what you're doing, you're interviewing for your job. Yeah. That idea that I am clear about our North Star. And with this client, we're very clear about their purpose. We're clear about their strategy. So nobody should be saying, hey, boss, I don't know what we're doing here. Everybody should say, this is our target customer, community, whatever their role is in the organization. But to your point, even if the strategy is loose, I should know the impact I'm supposed to make when I walk in in the morning. And we hope they're passionate about it. Yeah. That's something that we've talked a lot with clients about is that five-year plan, the way the five-year plan used to be done, or even the three-year plan, the way it used to be done, is kind of just an exercise now because we can't see the future that far out. And to really have, what are those, instead of having it all mapped out, what are those areas of focus? What are the three to five things that are our areas of focus to move us toward our vision? For your client, thinking about exactly what you said, like every single person on that leadership team has a piece of moving that purpose and vision forward. I think what could happen is that they get competitive with each other. And because they all know that am I going to be on this leadership team in the first place? And so am I going to try to throw somebody else under the bus <laughs> to make sure that my, my position is safe, as opposed to saying, no, we're all headed in the same direction. And here's my piece. And this is why that piece is important, can be a collaborative way of doing it without competing, right? And what we look at when we look at culture And passion specifically, and we can measure this, are they passionate about the company and what the company's purpose is? And are they passionate about their role in it? Because if they don't understand their role in it, they're not actually going to be able to bring as much value to the role and to furthering that purpose as if they were. How do you measure that? Because I am thinking of examples of somebody who's in operations and the budget gets cut and they have an opportunity to go to training. Happy to keep a job. I'll do training while I need to. I'm passionate about paying my house payment. I may not be passionate about training. 
And so I do see people who are in roles for all kinds of reasons that they're not passionate about. So I'm curious, how do you measure their passion for the role and their passion for the mission? First, you need to have one. Yeah. So do you have that purpose? Do people understand it? And even companies that are very purpose-driven, I often see they don't take that next step to help each person in the company understand their part in it. A lot of times leaders think that people can connect the dots themselves. That's because you've connected the dots yourself. Doesn't mean that everybody else can connect the dots themselves, right? Because you understand it better than they do. You helped create it. You're more part of the evolution of it. Each person in the organization isn't part of those conversations. So they might not see how does what they do connect to the purpose. And then, of course, the foundation of all of that is trust. So you can't have passion for your role and passion for the purpose if you don't have the foundation of trust in the organization. We have a a survey that we use with clients that, that actually measures those three things. What is the level of trust that's in the organization? Do they trust the company? Do they trust their immediate supervisor? And then how passionate are they about the role? And then how passionate are they about the company, right? And so we look at measuring different dimensions of what makes somebody passionate about their role in the company. But I think it really comes down first to communication, right? Are you communicating your purpose as a leader? Are you connecting the dots to everything that you do that connects to the purpose? We have this goal or we have this area of focus in our strategy, and this is how it's furthering our purpose. We're recognizing this team because they did a great job, and this is how what they did is furthering our purpose, right? So it's not about creating a separate communication campaign for purpose. It's about really weaving that red thread into everything that you do. You're helping them connect the dots to everything that they do. And then they get more excited about furthering that. When they start to see it come to life, and they're like, oh, yeah, and I can contribute it this way. I sometimes get executives that will tell me, oh, people aren't motivated. They don't want to work. And kind of blaming, especially the younger generation, they're blaming them that they're not motivated. They don't really want jobs. They don't really want to work. But when you really get them engaged in the purpose, they come to life. They do want to do a good job. But how are you helping them understand how they're contributing? What is the value of their role? And really having each person understand how they're moving the company forward, how what you do matters. This is why you're here. This is why we need you. And this is why we need this role. So for example, you mentioned like somebody's doing training and they maybe they're not so passionate about the training. Well, maybe they don't see how training is contributing to the purpose, how them training each person is actually changing that person's ability to do their job, which is then connecting to furthering the purpose. And by the way, back to our earlier point, and because they're happier in their job, they're going home happy and contributing to the community as well. As I think back about where I was earlier in my career, I always wanted to make an impact. So back to your personality type or your why, that was always important to me. Paying the bills was a priority because I didn't want to live with my parents. That was probably my biggest why, like be independent first, make an impact second. Now that I am not at risk of living with my parents, it's all about impact. Are they, the younger folks, that much different than we were? Having purpose and meaning is a human thing. And I think going back to the younger generation is that they will disengage faster than the older generations did. And if you think about it, even those older generations that stuck with a job that maybe they didn't love, or even today are in a job that maybe they don't love, are they doing it because they think they don't have a choice? That is what I see with a lot of my clients that are in the older generations is, well, this is how you're supposed to do things. And so therefore, this is what I'm doing. And I actually don't have a choice. I'm kind of stuck here and I just have to live with it. You know, when I left Disney, there were a lot of people that were shocked. I was an executive at the Walt Disney Company. That's a big deal. And I was leaving to start my own business. What? Right. Like people are like, what are you doing? That's insane. They're like, why? Like, it's such a big risk. Why would you do this when you have a great job at a great company with a great future and you're making an impact there? But for me, I saw because of what I went through and what I learned, I saw that I could actually make a bigger impact, number one, from outside the company because I wasn't part of the political structure. And number two, I could make a bigger impact by working with a bunch of different companies and not just Disney. But people from the outside were questioning that. Even just thinking, do you have a choice about how do you bring 
your why to life, first of all, you have to know it. And second, being able to make the choices that are aligned with that and that you do actually have a choice. And there is the working toward it. Yeah. I took a career aptitude test five years into my work life. What I learned is I was doing absolutely the wrong thing, which I knew, and that's why I took the career aptitude test. I really considered that I could have to take a pay cut. I had a house payment. What does this mean for my life? And what's my plan one year, three years, five years? Now, I was fortunate to be able to move into something that aligned, but I thought I was going to get a law school, and that's a long-term financial commitment. I wasn't in a position where I could just quit working, go to law school, and pay my house payment. We've heard I didn't want to move into my parents' basement. Right. So there was a plan. Now, fortunately, I found something else that was a better fit that didn't require five years of school. And for those people listening who are saying, okay, I may not be able to get there now, but there's a path and I plan for the path and I budget for it. I ended up going to graduate school at night. It paid off, but not without significant effort. Yes, we have choices. I think even connecting with that piece of who you are, your why, really helps to see the value that you bring and that superpower that you do have. And sometimes when we think we don't have a choice, we're not connected to that, right? We're kind of going through the day-to-day, checking the box, and not really connecting with ourselves at that level to see that there are other opportunities, to see that there are other options is it easy? No, absolutely not. Similar to you. Like, it took me a year to be able to get to a place where I was comfortable living Disney when I made the decision of what I was going to do. And the time I actually left was a year doing exactly what you're saying, preparing. How am I going to do this financially? Starting to look at what would the marketing be? What's the name of the company? All those things, right? So it wasn't like I turned off one switch and turned on another. As you connect with who you are, what are the opportunities? What are those options? And it's a process. It's not something that you just decide tomorrow. I was speaking to a group of female attorneys. We talked about purpose, and it was real estate law. And most of them were not incredibly passionate about real estate law. They were really good at real estate law. It's a top firm, and these were very senior women. And one of the women said, but I am passionate about providing a good future for my children. And this gives me that opportunity. It was interesting to see people make the connection with this is the path that allows me to do the thing I'm most passionate about. Either I'm passionate about the work or I'm passionate about what the work allows me to do is also an interesting distinction. Yeah, absolutely. And we find when people say that they know their why, that's what they talk about. My why is my family. My why is my faith. My why is making a difference in the world or changing the world. What we say is those are your who's and your what's, but not necessarily your why. So going back to the clients that I was mentioning earlier, so the the person whose why is right way, she didn't really connect with her job and she wasn't as passionate about her job until she recognized that that was her superpower. She was just struggling to try to make her boss happy and it was tanking her self-confidence. And she was questioning her ability to do the job, in fact. When we connected her to her why of your what drives you, what fulfills you, is finding the right way of doing things, finding those repeatable systems and processes, getting consistent results. It completely changed her relationship with her job. So while, yes, her why was her family before we started that process, now she gets, this is the value. This is what drives me. This is what fulfills me. For me personally, that's never something I'd be interested in. That's, that's like almost completely opposite me. But for her, that's what really drives her. That's what really fulfills her when she's able to do that, when she's able to look at how do we create this so that it's repeatable and predictable and so that we always know we're going to get the same result. And she gets really excited about that. And that really motivates and drives her. So when we talk about why it's really about that internal motivation, about what is it that you really bring to the world? What is it that you're bringing to your job? And when you understand understand that the job that you thought, you know, might be real estate law, the job you thought that you were kind of eh about actually becomes really exciting because you see how what drives you connects to what you do. One of the things in our prep material we talked about was that phrase, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And we've talked about strategy now in our current context. It's harder to predict and control than we did. But my sense is we still need strategy 
it's just done differently and relied on differently. What are you thinking about strategy and culture and how they fit? Strategy is 100% critical. If you don't know where you're going, you're going to be lost, especially in today's market. This goes back to what I was saying earlier, like that being reactive and just following whatever is fashionable or trendy, (laughs) right? Or what everybody else are doing. The best practices, like you said, is that aligned with our strategy? Is that where we're trying to go? Is critical to have that. And yes, we say culture doesn't eat strategy for breakfast. They need to have breakfast together. That means that one is not more important than the other. You have to have a business strategy. Whether you like it or not, you have a culture. Even if you're not doing anything to build a culture, you have a culture. Are you being proactive and intentional about building a culture that's connected to supporting your business strategy to further that, to make it happen faster, to make it happen more efficiently, more profitably? So your culture can really support what you're trying to do as a business. And at the same time, you can't have a business without a strategy, right? You're, you're not going to be in business very long. You're going to start to get pulled around and yanked around by everything that's happening. And businesses in the past were able to survive doing that. I don't think that they're going to survive in the speed of change that we're in and with the uncertainty that we have. Businesses are going to start to collapse if they don't have that touchstone of their purpose and their strategy. I use this example a few years ago, I think it might have been 2021 or so, that there were these two TV series that came out around the same time. One was about WeWork and one was about Uber. Well, of course, they were fictionalized and dramatized, but I thought that they really brought to life this concept of leaning too far in one direction or the other. Uber, when they first started out, was 100% strategy growth to the detriment of their people. They killed their people right (laughs) right in the process, really burning people out and churning through them and, and not being a great place to work, completely focused on business growth at the cost of everything else. That's one extreme. WeWork was the other extreme, which was all about the culture and having parties and making people happy. To the detriment of the business, they almost went out of business because they were so focused on culture and not really looking at how does this fit into context with our business strategy. So I I really love those two TV series because it brought to life what happens when you go to one extreme. And that's why I don't agree with culture eat strategy for breakfast, because I think sometimes people lean too far on the culture side and can be detrimental to the business. I'm also misunderstanding what culture means. Culture doesn't mean pizza parties. Culture doesn't mean the ping pong tables and the things that are going to make people feel comfortable at work. Culture means, are they passionate about what you do and your purpose? And are they passionate about their role in it? It's everything that happens in the organization. It's how things work around here. From your purpose and your vision to your processes, to how you're structured and how you make decisions, how people are treated and their values. It all comes together and that's what creates culture. And I think sometimes people try to surface what culture means and can almost, to their detriment, miss the point on, yeah, maybe you're having pizza Fridays and you have ping pong tables, but how decisions are made, how you take in diverse thought, how you're treating your customers or your clients, all of that is culture. So you can have pizza parties and ping pong tables and still have extreme disengagement because you're not in alignment with everything else that you're doing. We talk about it as agreements. Things like, how do we define value? Is it just financial results? Is it result in developing people? Is it vision result in developing people? But it is very much the agreements about how we choose to operate. And it's very deliberate And the three tiers are, we've got enough and we do enough, we get by, Mm -hmm. and we do it in an operationally excellent way. There's nothing wrong with what we do. The next level is we do a good job at all that, and we are perpetually developing and improving. And then the third is we shoot for exceptional. If you're a person who wants to get it right and do it right, You may thrive more in an organization that's focusing on getting it right and doing right in an organization whose agreements really over-index on what's possible. What can we possibly do? What impact can we make in the world? That's a different culture than we're excellent at doing what our customers ask for. I love your point about every company has a different culture. I think it's an important point. And it doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It's what's alignment with your 
purpose and your vision and your strategy, where you want to go. What's the culture that we need to support that? So I worked a number of years ago as part of an acquisition where one company that was large acquired like a mid-sized company. And they were really in a lot of conflict about aligning the two companies and bringing them together. They brought us in to try to help to figure out how do we stop this because everything is being slowed down on the integration because they just can't get along. The company that had acquired, I knew very well. They're a very large company, very process-driven, very much about efficiency, continuous improvement, excellence, you know, and but a lot of structure. And it was right for their business strategy of who they wanted to be at that time. I went to the building of the company that they were acquired and they had their values on the stairs as you walked in the building. And one of their values was ready, fire, aim. And I went, okay, here's the problem. Like you see the world in two totally different ways, right? And and then just bringing that awareness to this is what's valued at the acquiring company and this is what's valued at the acquired company and this is how they're different and this is why you make decisions different. How are you going to approach this now? As you are coming together, where do you want to keep some of the culture of the acquired company? Where do you need to bring in some of the structure of the acquiring company? We were able to have those conversations and they actually understood that neither one was right. It was just a different culture and a different strategy of where they were trying to be as a company. And they were able to come up with a third version that was what they were going to agree together. Often in mergers and integrations, there isn't attention given to the intangibles in that way, which is why we end up with some of the acquisitions ending up being spinoffs pretty quickly. And there are frameworks to be very deliberate in due diligence and in integration to help us think this through. It shouldn't be a surprise. And I think for the best M&A folks, it's absolutely how they do business. And for a lot of people, it's just something they've not learned. Yeah. And it's focusing more on that business strategy and and less on the culture part, whereas they're both important, right? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Back to breakfast buddies, not one or the other. Yeah. Do you do work with companies during acquisitions to help the due diligence phase? Yes, we have. The further we can get up in the process, the more we can help them prepare with day one, actually having a plan on how do these two things come together. And even to who their leadership team is going to be, how are they going to do that change management process through the integration? Once you have those understandings right up front, it makes that whole process starting from day one much faster. Yeah, because it's a painful process otherwise. Yeah. When you don't know how decisions are made and you think you've made a decision and you haven't, or you have, and the other person is behaving what appears to be erratically, having that deliberate conversation this is where an external point of view can help, right? Because I say culture is sometimes invisible to the people that are in it. And the example I use is a fish can't see its own water, right? You don't really see the impacts and the differences of how things work around here when you're in it necessarily. Even when I was at Disney, I came in after Disney had acquired ABC and ESPN. From a communications perspective, We call people that work in a theme park cast members because when they come out, it's part of the culture. When they come out, they're on stage. Well, if you call somebody from ABC News a cast member, it's very offensive because they're a serious journalist. They're not an actor. Even those cultures of of how you communicate and those little nuances where you're creating complete disengagement just on the language that you're using. ABC had been acquired for probably seven or eight years before I came in, and they didn't realize that they were creating that disconnect where ABC didn't really feel part of Disney because they weren't talking to them, right? And so they just ignored anything that came from Disney, right? <laughs> so, so, and so it really was how do we start to integrate and really make them feel part of the company and understand why they're here, how are they contributing to the, the vision, why they're important to the company, and how we are all one Walt Disney company. Yeah, because you think about that's billions of dollars of value that's destroyed when it's done poorly. Absolutely. Sonia, thank you so much. This has been really insightful, and I love the conversation. Me too. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really, really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope your listeners found it valuable too, because I definitely did. So how would our listeners find you? The best way is to come to our website, executiveleader.com. We have a lot of free resources there. We have more information about the Y Connection. We have a free training on Red Thread Leadership. 
There's also a contact page that has our social and I'm very active on LinkedIn. The best place to start is our webpage and you'll find every way to get in touch with us from there. Thank you also to our listeners. This is Maureen Metcalf, Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. And we trust that the conversation with Sonia today is going to help you become more future ready. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.